As the tide goes out over the rocky shores, the intertidal zones are revealed to us. No other habitat in the oceans or land experiences such a vast range of temperatures, salt concentrations and wave exposure. Who would expect somewhere that we could find so relaxing as humans to be so stressful for other species? Given how stressful it is to simply survive in this ever-changing environment, you'd expect the species found here to be the roughest, toughest guys around. Yet one of the most aggressive and territorial of these species found on the rocky shore are these fearsome little blobs. These are beadlet anemones, scientifically known as Actinia aquina, and one of approximately 12 anemone species commonly found here in the UK. Beadlets are the most widespread and have varying colour morphs, the most common being red and green. Unlike other species commonly found on the rocky shore, beadlet tentacles are retractable, which is why when the tide goes out, they're often observed as small blobs on the rocky shore. But when immersed in water, they open up and bloom almost like a flower to catch food. These tentacles contain toxins that they use to sting and catch passing prey. However, their tentacles aren't the only thing packing a toxic punch. Beadlets have another special weapon, specifically designed for members of their own species. Surrounding their oral disc, beadlets have these blue nodules called acrohagy, which contain up to six different toxins. But how exactly do they use these? I'm here now visiting the labs at Plymouth University to meet Sarah, an anemone specialist who can give me the science behind this spectacle. Hello, so nice to, nice meet, to meet you. you so what brought you into studying anemones and their aggression? So when I finished my PhD, I was looking for a job um, and I saw an advert for a postdoc studying fighting in anemones. Um, and I didn't know that much about anemones at the time and I definitely didn't know that they fought. So I thought I have to learn more about this um, and I applied for the job. So how do they actually fight when they're competing? What do they do? Like, what, what's the process? The enemies will only fight when they come into contact, physical contact with each other, mm -hmm. because they're fighting over territory. So the enemies will be next to each other, they'll start touching uh, feeding tentacles together. Um, we don't actually know what goes on during that time, we think there's probably a lot of chemical communication. But basically that will occur and then if one of them decides, I don't want to escalate this, then it will either close up entirely, so you pull those tentacles in, or it will move away. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes, obviously, the fight has to escalate because neither of them will give up. Um, and if that's the case, then one of the anemones, the attacker, will basically inflate its body, so it fill itself with more water, so it can become taller than its opponent. It will then inflate those acrohagy, um, so those bright blue weapons, and it will then come crashing down and scrape those down the side of its opponent. Um, and when it does that, it leaves behind these bright blue pieces of its own acrohagy that are full of these stinging cells. Um, and they then cause localised necrosis, so cell death, essentially, mm -hmm. on the opponent. Um, and that lasts long after the attacker is gone. If they've got their tentacles well, but they're not as strong, then why, why not just use the acrohagy? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, well, well it's, not, it's not necessarily about the strength of the toxins, so it's not that the acrohagal toxins are stronger per se, it's just that they're different, they're different. yes, they work differently um, and they, they can be used against other anemones of the same species, whereas those feeding toxins can't. Interestingly though, there have been studies looking at what actually um, kind of elicits those acrohagy to release the stinging cells. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there were some papers in the 70s where they had, you know, an anemone and then they were placing different different things against the acrohagy mm -hmm. to see what would cause it to release these sort of harpoon-like stinging cells. Yeah. And the only thing that will cause them to release those stinging cells is another, is the, another you know, the, the, another beetle an enemy. As I said, when they use the acrohagy, they leave behind pieces of the acrohagy mm -hmm. that have ripped off. And what that actually means is that the attacker ends up with holes in its acrohagy. Oh, wow. So potentially there is a cost okay, to, to, inflicting, well. yeah, okay. to inflicting those attacks. So it could be that actually uh, it's too costly to use those unless you need to use yeah. them. It's a really fun fact. I didn't mm. know that at all. 
So these anemones do appear to be really abundant. Every time I go to the rocky shore, I see them everywhere. So is there anything actually threatening them at all, or are they just fine? Anemones are quite hardy, um, well, especially the species, so they're intertidal, so like any other intertidal um, creature, they have to be reasonably tolerant to environmental mm -hmm. changes um, as the tide goes in and out. Um, but we don't know whether that tolerance will extend to dealing with these kind of more drastic human-induced environmental changes. Sarah's work reminded me, and hopefully you as well, that a species doesn't have to be in serious trouble for us to appreciate it in all its wonder. In fact, the commonality of these beadlet anemones on our rocky shores can facilitate anyone to go and appreciate their beauty and behaviours. And it's not just these anemones that are worth looking at. Rock pools host a huge diversity of life, from algae to anemones, crabs to fish. Learning about all animals and plants in different environments can only help us to further understand our natural world, our place within it, and how we can best manage and protect it.